Gravity wants to squeeze it out of existence. Nuclear fusion wants to blow it out of existence. Depending on the winner of this conflict, if this cloud of gas and dust is big enough, then its ultimate fate will either be a black hole or a supernova. But until such time, we have something that's truly amazing. A star. Without them, the universe, for the most part, would be featureless to the naked eyes. In 1838, Frederick Bessel, a German astronomer, was able to measure the distance to a star. With this critical information, we were able to calculate the actual brightness of a star using the inverse square law. We found out that the stars had similar properties such as brightness and temperature to our sun. Thus, stars were faraway suns in a world of their own, perhaps with a planetary system that we may be able to visit someday. But until then, we can learn a lot from our own sun if we had spacecraft doing just that. The Earth's atmosphere extends up to 700 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, but most of it is below the official beginning of space, which is about 80 to 100 kilometers. Yet, this effective atmosphere of only 100 kilometers is our main protection against all of the dangerous aspects of space. In the late 1950s, we only had a basic idea of what these dangers were and were not able to quantify them very well. But things started to change when the Americans launched the Orbiting Solar Observatory 1, or OSO-1, in 1962, the first spacecraft specifically designed to perform long-term observation of a celestial body. The spacecraft measured the sun's output of gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolets for two years. The long-term nature of this mission allowed the OSO-1 to also measure the momenta and kinetic energies of impacting interplanetary dust particles on the spacecraft. Aside from that, better technology in spacecraft stabilization and sun tracking were also tested. It requires a little less energy to perform a flyby of Venus than it is of Mars. That could have been the reason why the first interplanetary spacecraft by the Soviets, Venera 1, was sent to Venus instead of Mars. But in any event, the extra energy required to get to Mars is more than worth it because the surface of Mars can be seen from space. Venus is surrounded by a thick atmosphere, making it impossible to see its surface using visible light. So it's no surprise that after the failure of Venera 1 to successfully perform a flyby of Venus, the next Soviet interplanetary mission targeted Mars instead. Mars 1 was launched by the Soviets in 1962. It became the first spacecraft to perform a flyby of Mars. Unfortunately, just like Venera 1, contact with Mars 1 was also lost but at a much further distance of 107 million kilometers. This made it the furthest radio communication at that time. Mars 1 closest approach to Mars was calculated to be 193,000 kilometers. A month after the launch of Mars 1, another Venus flyby attempt would be made, not by the Soviets, but this time by the Americans. Mariner 2 was launched at the end of 1962 and became the first spacecraft to return close-up data about a planet when it performed the flyby of Venus. This is an important step in space exploration because there's a hard limit to the detail that can be acquired about a celestial body from Earth. This is primarily due to the distance from the body in our atmosphere. Mariner 2 confirmed lots of the measurements about Venus that were made from Earth. The nearly uniform temperature on the day and night side 
was one of the measurements that was confirmed. In addition, Mariner 2 also made new and more accurate ones. These included the rotation of Venus being slow compared to Earth, and also that it's retrograde, meaning that it rotates in the opposite direction of the Sun. The surface temperature of Venus was measured at 475 degrees Celsius on average. This unambiguously high temperature on the surface of Venus was the beginning of the end for a hypothesis among some of the scientists at that time that the cloud covers around Venus was water vapor. This water vapor then led to speculation that there was vast oceans and continents on the surface of Venus, which led to further speculation that there was life on Venus, similar to prehistoric life on Earth. During the time of the late 1950s, Venus was the focus for space science fiction authors, but now, with the surface temperature at 475 degrees Celsius measured by Mariner 2, it was no longer possible to entertain such a hypothesis. Mariner 2's closest approach to Venus was about 35,000 kilometers. This was only possible because Mariner 2 also had the ability to perform mid-course correction, just like Venera 1. These are also called Trajectory Control Maneuver, or TCM, and are essential for any planetary voyage. While hopes of life on Venus vanished when Mariner 2 returned close-up data of the planet, Mars, on the other hand, was still filled with speculation about life. The most popular hypothesis about life on Mars at that time was the one put forward earlier in 1906 by an American astronomer named Percival Lowell. In the late 1800s, Italian astronomers made some observation of Mars and thought they were looking at channels or gullies. The Italian word for channels is canale. Percival Lowell misinterpreted this word to mean canal in English, and canal implies that an intelligent being built these structures on Mars, and thus the civilization on Mars hypothesis was born. By the beginning of the 1960s, almost all astronomers had serious doubt about the civilization on Mars hypothesis, but couldn't just outright disprove it. Then. In 1965, Mariner 4 sent by the Americans made the first successful flyby of Mars. It was the first spacecraft to take a photograph of a planet from deep space. And this photograph brought a sudden end to the civilization on Mars hypothesis. There were no cities, or even ruins, just craters. Once again, a Mariner spacecraft changed the direction of space science fiction. The images captured by Mariner 4 took about 6 hours each to download from Mars at a data rate of about 8.33 bits per second. Mariner 4 closest approach to Mars was about 10,000 kilometers. This distance is close to the orbital distance of Mars's inner moon Phobos orbiting Mars at 6,000 kilometers. There was some concern about the potential collision with that moon but that never happened. In addition to photographing Mars and collecting scientific data about it and its immediate surroundings, Mariner 4 also tested spacecraft durability in long-term duration interplanetary flight. It also performed the first successful stellar navigation. Reliable stellar navigation such as the one used by Mariner 4 really opened the door to the solar system. Combine that with the trajectory control maneuvers, and there's no place in the solar system we couldn't reach, provided we had a powerful enough launch vehicle. These two systems alone, however, only allowed us to either perform a flyby or direct impact at the destination. We have performed both of these methods with past missions and they have yielded useful information about the target body, but they have their limitations. Flyby requires the least amount of energy because a spacecraft doesn't have to spend energy slowing down at the destination. The downside to that is the spacecraft has a limited amount of time 
to collect useful data about the target body before it's out of range again. An impactor can collect very detailed data about a very small area of the atmosphere and surface of a target body, but the downside to that is the data collection time is extremely small. It's in the matter of hours. In either case, the spacecraft will not safely land on the targeted world. And this is an obvious requirement if we're going to engage in long-term exploration of distant worlds. So once again, our moon served as a testing ground. In 1966, Lunar 9 sent by the Soviets made the first soft landing on another world. This allowed it to take the first photograph from the surface of another world. To keep the payload mass at launch to minimum, but still have the additional fuel required to soft land on the moon, the mass of the landing module was severely limited. This resulted in the lander having only a camera and one scientific instrument, a Geiger counter radiation detector. Luna 9 was also the first spacecraft to utilize airbags to cushion its landing. Although the earlier mission of Luna 2 proved that the moon was solid, Luna 9 proved that the dusty surface of the moon was strong enough to support the weight of a spacecraft. There was a short-lived speculation that the surface of the moon was covered with a layer of dust so thick that a spacecraft would sink in it. This was proven false by Luna 9. Mariner 2 discovered that the temperature on Venus is 475 degrees Celsius on average at surface level. Designing a spacecraft in such an environment is extremely challenging. This high temperature is due in part to the thick atmosphere of Venus. The atmospheric pressure on the surface of Venus is 92 times that of Earth's atmospheric surface pressure. Even though such high pressure makes designing a spacecraft that can survive in such an environment difficult, Interestingly enough, it also makes it easier to slow down the spacecraft that enters such environment. This directly translates into a less complicated soft landing system, and this may have been one reason the Soviets launched Venera 3 with the lander, even though they still had yet to successfully collect scientific data from Venus from all previous Venera flyby missions. Whatever the motivation was, the lander of Venera 3 became the first man-made object to land on another planet. The addition of a lander created more challenges that the engineers of Venera 3 had to resolve. Venera 3 was the first spacecraft designed to have a surface-bound probe use the main spacecraft as a communication relay. It was also the first spacecraft to use gallium-based solar panels instead of the less efficient silicon ones. Most solar panels on spacecraft today are gallium-based. Due to its unique mission that required it to pass through an atmosphere which at high altitude could potentially support life, the lander of Venera 3 was the first spacecraft that had to be sterilized before launch to avoid potential contamination of the target planet by microbes originating from Earth. A parachute was also included for the first time on the spacecraft. Venera 3 performed as planned on its way to Venus, but shortly before releasing the lander, which is actually an atmospheric probe, communication with the spacecraft was lost. Based on its last known trajectory and finding no evidence that would prevent the release of the atmospheric probe, it was concluded that the probe did in fact crash into Venus. Although Luna 9 was successful in placing a lander on the surface of the moon, gathering data of the entire surface of the moon or any other celestial body is impossible by just landing on it. To gather data about the entire planet, a spacecraft would need to orbit that body continuously for an extended period, something that has never been done before because it requires additional energy and sometimes multiple restarting of the engine, which could be problematic. But in the end, it's just one of the many challenges we'll have to overcome in our journey to the stars. In the next episode of From Cradle to Planets, we'll continue this journey starting 
with the first artificial satellite around another world. Now we can monitor that world for as long as we want as we prepare for humans to journey to the stars. I'm DexDFX for Aiming for the Stars.